Yeah, I mean, the biggest fear is, you know, from, from women, it's cancer, right? You know, is that, well, hormones cause cancer, hormones cause cancer. And then men too, testosterone causes ca prostate cancer, right? You get that all the time. And for women, estrogen causes breast cancer. It has been pounded into everybody's head. And, you know, you know, even the American Urologic Society now is saying, you know, not actually, we, we actually, even men who have had prostate cancer, mm -hmm. they're advising that testosterone therapy appears to reduce the recurrence and the severity of disease. So even the, you know, one of the most stout foundations is, co is coming around and saying, hmm, maybe our evidence wasn't right. I mean, testosterone, if testosterone caused prostate cancer, why is the 20 year old who has sky high levels not getting prostate cancer and the 80 year old who has no testosterone getting prostate cancer? It mm -hmm. just literally doesn't make sense. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, Welcome to Old God Talks to Me, a podcast dedicated to helping guys create kick-ass lives for themselves and those that they love. Ladies, if you want to know what your guy is thinking, this podcast is for women too. Each week, a special guest helps you create that life you've imagined. We talk anti-aging medicine, personal growth, relationships and hot sex. Yeah, you hear me, getting laid more frequently other guy vices, and topics that many don't want to talk about but need to. Just because you're getting older doesn't mean you have to be old. Don't want to miss anything? Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review this podcast. And be sure to go to www.thestandard.academy forward slash magazine and grab a free copy of our new digital magazine. The Standard Academy, where we talk about erogenous zones, growing hair back, and other things that will help you create that kick-ass life. Now get ready to listen up and share with friends. This is Oris, the official old guy at oldguytalkstome.com, a podcast dedicated to helping older guys create kick-ass lives for themselves and those that they love. That's right, those that they love. And uh, sometimes those that they love, they well, they want, if, you, if they like you, if they like you, they want to keep you around for a while. <laughs> and so, so the, the, the deal there is that uh, we're going to have, we've got Dr. Elizabeth Yurth, and she's a physician, and uh, she's got a whole bunch of letters uh, behind her name after, after MD. You may don't say them all, that'll take the whole time. I know, ABPMR, <laughs> ABAR, a whole, just a whole bunch of letters. I have no idea what they mean. Uh, maybe sometime you can you have, explain them all. Have, have your I don't know either. Have your or person explain okay. to me what they but mean. Letters don't mean a lot. Oh yes, they do. I'm sure you, you worked hard. You worked to get those letters. Those are those those aren't just. It's not. It's not just an alphabet there. So she's the medical director of the Boulder Longevity Institute, which she co-founded in 2006, and she specializes in advanced research-based longevity medicine, including treatments such as bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, regenerative orthopedic procedures, and regenerative peptide, with a result-oriented approach to health optimization. She obtained her medical degree from the University of Southern California Keck School of Medicine, or known as the University of Spoiled Children. Um, <laughs> I, I, that, that's actually where I did my residency and completed her residency at the University of California in Irvine. Along with her 25 years plus experience practicing orthopedists, she specialized in sports and spine medicine. And she also made her mission to learn and share the latest scientific research on how to truly heal the body at the cellular level. And she's a double board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation and anti-aging regenerative medicine. And she's a specialist in sports, spine, and regenerative medicine. She has a Stanford affiliated fellowship in sports and spine medicine and a dual fellowship in anti-aging regenerative medicine. Well, that's the F -F -F -A -A -R -M. There it goes. Now it's all explained to me here in, this, in your bio. Yeah. There we go. She's an active athlete herself and has consulted with numerous sports teams, including the San Francisco 49ers and the Stanford University women's basketball and soccer team. She has served as a physician for the San Jose Cleveland Ballet. And today, Dr. Yurth resides in Boulder, Colorado with her husband and five children. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Got through that. Yeah. There's yeah, there's, time a, left. There's, there's a lot. There's a lot. And I and, and, and the, the full version, folks, will be in the uh, in the show notes. It's it's actually five pages long. Uh and uh and, and so so it's it's gonna be it's gonna be in there and also uh, all of her contact information and how to get in touch and, and if you want to work with her, uh what what that's all about. So uh so let me ask you, and this is what I always ask my all my guests at the very beginning, what's the most important thing you've done today? 
got to the gym. It's my first okay. thing I do every morning. Get up. Actually, getting out of bed is probably the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but, but but yeah, my my morning always starts with I go to the gym. I, I I'm usually at the gym at 5 a.m. and you know, do a nice little hour workout to get my day started. So that always makes me feel better. Well, good, good. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think having a morning routine is real important. Uh, it, it sets the tone. Sets the tone for the day. Yeah, and I don't know about you, but if I don't get my workouts in early usually my day gets busy and you know by the end i'm i'm like oh i can't get there i don't have time yeah <laughs> so, yeah it, it, same here if i if, if the workout doesn't happen in the morning right it's done it right. ain't gonna happen it ain't gonna happen because there's so many other things happen yeah uh, including happy hour uh so <laughs> <laughs> workout or happy hour workout or happy hour. Uh, that's, that's not that's an easy choice <laughs> so um tell us a little bit about how did you get into this regenerative medicine longevity space? So my background, so I came from a kind of interesting angle because my background is in more orthopedic medicine and um, practice orthopedic medicine, been practicing for 30 years. And then about 17, 18 years ago, I started to get sort of frustrated. It was sort of like I was just patching people back together. Um, you know, you kind of get things better and you've had injuries, you know how this goes. You're like, well, I guess it's okay. It's never great, right? You mm -hmm. hurt yourself and you're never great, but you're like, I guess I'm okay. This is as good as it gets. And, you know, and, and, and then people would come back with either that same thing wrong or something else wrong. And so I, so I started to explore how do we actually get people really cured, really healthy and started to realize that was a lot more than orthopedics that you had to actually get people healthy. And so I started to, this is way back in kind of the early generation of functional medicine doctors. And, and so I started to explore more health focused medicine and how do I get the body healthy and then it heals and maybe I actually can get these injuries better. So went back and did a fellowship in, in um, anti-aging and regenerative medicine, and then kind of incorporated that into my orthopedic practice. But that was really difficult because, you know, in your 10 minute appointments, you can't really talk about how diet and exercise and supplements and everything else can influence your healing and recovery. And, and, and over the past few years, we've even learned a lot more. We, we now know that, you know, that really even degen what we've termed degenerative arthritis is a disease process. It's not really just wear and tear that we always thought. So we've learned a lot. So went back and did that fellowship. And then I actually sort of kept two practices, my orthopedic practice and a regenerative medicine practice for a long time until a few years ago when it just became a little too exhausting to try and do two practices. And so I kind of combined the orthopedics into my regenerative medicine practice. So, so we do a lot of very novel approaches to treating joint disease, but also do a lot for just trying to get people healthy and feeling good and increasing what we call health span. You know, not just having you live longer, but having you feel really good and feel like you did when you're 20 until you're 120. Yeah. So that, that kind of leads into my next question here. Um, uh, when you say longevity, what, what does that mean to you? So I think people think about longevity as living a long time. And, you know, and I think the problem with that is if you ask somebody, do you want to live to 100? Most people go, no, because they've watched their parents age or some, somebody age. And they think about these frail little old people sitting in wheelchairs in nursing homes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I don't know if you've been there, but I've been there with my parents. I watched a very, you know, hearty my dad, who was a super, super, I mean, my dad was climbing 14ers at 80, but, you know, as he got into his nineties, you know, or late eighties, you know, he started to decline. He wasn't walking well anymore. And, you know, and he wasn't particularly happy because his life sort of revolved a lot around the activities he liked to do. And so you watch these people decline and you say, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to go there. I'd rather die before I become debilitated or somebody has to take care of me. Right. So people, he, when you ask sort of across the board, do people want to live to be a hundred? They go, nah. I just, I don't, I don't want to live that long. And that's the wrong paradigm. So when I think about longevity, what we really want to think about is being healthy. So as long as possible, being as healthy as you can be. And, and, you know, truly, if you truly do everything, the hope is you actually can live quite healthily to be 120. Um, you know, after that, probably start replacing organs and things we don't know, but, but the key is we want to keep our 120 year old running races and climbing mountains and skiing and engaging with people and having fun. If that's, if all I'm doing is extending lifespan, that's not doing it. Right. So the goal of longevity is health span. It's making you have this healthy, vital life for a really long time. Yeah. I, you know, um, just, well, at the beginning of this year in January, uh, I had a, uh, 
I had an, an emergency ostomy, <laughs> which was a life changer. Yeah. Uh, and it was, uh, fortunately, and for those of you who don't know what ostomy is, basically is they resect your intestine from your colon and they, they basically you shit out through your stomach into a bag. And, um, and uh, it got reversed, uh, thank God. Uh, yeah. Several months later, it got reversed. But my biggest fear is, that, and you see this all the time, you see this fairly regularly, like in the gym, you see uh, an older guy who's been very, very vibrant. And all of a sudden something happens like this, like what, what right, I had. Right. And I was my, my biggest fear, and I had to really guard myself psychologically about this, is, was becoming decrepit uh it was it was like that that was like that was yeah. the thing that I was focused on avoiding or you know getting back to where I was and doing what I what I was able to do which I which I fortunately have been able to but you just see that I mean it just happens all the time yeah uh, you know, right and it can't happen you're right it can't happen pretty fast I mean I see you know in my orthopedic practice I saw all the time where somebody you know even relatively young like they're 75 years old right and they fall and break a hip exactly and, and you know that's a key guys falling and breaking your hip 90% of people will never get back to their functional level right you know because at that age it's hard to recover and you know and so our goal is that you can you know if you're treating your body right that you can recover and do well even from these bad things that life may deal you right yeah. that you, you you bounce back and you're ready to go and you can still fight on because you're right it, it, that that thought of being a little decrepit person in a wheelchair appeals to nobody some people ask me, do you want to be live to be 120? Yeah, I mean, because I picture myself as, you know, think all the cool things that are going to happen, guys. I mean, look at what's mm -hmm. happened already. I mean, we sure. should be able to go to the moon. We should be able to, you know, I don't know, have jetpacks. I, you know, there's so many cool things that are going to happen. I kind of want to be around to enjoy it. If we're not healthy, then it's not going to be fun. But you know, so that's our goal is, you know, and the problem is that you've got to start thinking about that, right? You start thinking about that when something bad happens, right? You had this horrible event. Mm -hmm. And now you're like, all of a sudden you're, you're thinking about, gosh, I don't want to be a little decrepit person or you have a heart attack or you break a bone. The key is the earlier you can start thinking about these things and focusing on longevity before some bad thing happens, the better prepared you're going to be. Yeah. I, for me personally, and um, <laughs> I don't know what your feelings are about this, but uh, I've been on testosterone optimization for over 25 years. And, yep. uh, and, and I, I thoroughly believe that, uh, my, uh, my ability to heal. I mean, I, after the, the, the reconnection surgery, I was out of the hospital within 24 hours. Yeah. And wow. My, my, my healing ability, I think was, was very good as importantly, uh, my mental state is very strong. Uh, you know, I am very, very, in terms of, uh, and I think a lot of that, I've noticed that when I go off testosterone, my mental state, and actually my wife notices mm -hmm. that I'm not as, as, as decisive and as happy as I as I am when I am, when I am on, on testosterone, um, you talk about uh, part of some of the things that that, that you mentioned is uh, foundational health. What is what is it, and why is it important? So you know, found, foundational health are the basics, and it's the stuff you guys read about all the time. I mean, it, so when you just read your magazines and things like that, it's okay eat your healthy diet, right? Get your eight hours of sleep, have a really normal circadian rhythm, meaning you should be going to sleep when it's dark and waking up when it's light. And you should be getting outside first thing in the morning and getting your body exposed to that light. Those are all things that are really important. We know that circadian rhythm is a key piece of longevity that, you know, for instance, if you're a night shift worker, uh, I was once at a lecture and somebody asked the, the lecturer who was talking about circadian rhythm. Well, I work at night. What can I do? And he said, quit your job. Because honestly, the, you know, wasn't a great answer, but the honestly having that circadian balance where we're exposed to the first morning light, we're exposed to dusk, where we sleep at night when it's dark, those are all really important factors to sort of longevity and health. We know that shift workers have a significant increased risk of cancer just because of that. Even if they're sleeping eight hours during the day, you can't get the same kind of sleep your circadian rhythm is off. So so restoring that circadian balance and you know, you know, if you sort of think about the if you were out camping, what would you be doing when it's dark? You go to bed, right? You know, and 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 that's really how we we're designed to live. So those are those are pieces that are just sort of key elements to foundational health. It's getting rid of the shitty food, and it's getting rid of the, you know, the high carb diets, and um, you know, and staying away from processed foods. But those are kind of things everybody really in, intuitively knows. And one of the things I always say is, 
you know, when we preach these things, we preach, okay, you've got to get up, you've got to exercise, you've got to be exposed to light, you have to eat these healthy diets. And we, we look at people who have zero hormones, right? You look at a, a woman or a guy who's now 50 and, and, you know, they don't have normal testosterone levels or progesterone levels. And I'm asking them to exercise, then they're not going to be able to, if I have new te no testosterone, I'm not gonna have any benefit from exercise. I'm not gonna feel the muscle growth. I'm not gonna get any of that. If I don't have progesterone, I can't sleep at night. So, so I actually lump, and this is different from a lot of physicians or a lot of your health coaches, I sort of lump into saying, you know, I think hormones have to fall in a little bit to that foundational health piece. Mm -hmm. And I think we're being a little bit naive in sort of saying you can do everything with your, you know, just great exercise and great diet um, and, you know, and, and restoring sleep. I, I think that the problem is how do you restore sleep if, you know, for a woman who's going through menopause and has having night sweats or for a guy who has no testosterone, testosterone is key to sleep. It's why when guys have sex, they fall asleep is because, you know, after you have sex, you get this big bump in testosterone and you fall asleep, right? Well, so testosterone is key to sleep. So I will lump that hormone optimization has to be a part of foundational health to get those other pieces in order. I, I think that sometimes doctors are like, oh, you just got to get to the exercise and you've got to, or gym and exercise and you've got to, you know, eat these foods. And to ask somebody who feels like you said, off testosterone, you don't feel well, you're not happy. You're not, you know, how do I ask you to do those other pieces? So I will lump that into a piece of foundational health as well. Yeah. I think it's funny. I, I, I laugh about this. I'm like, I got a smile on my face because my, uh, my PCP, uh, who I've been going to for over 25 years, uh, he was really down on what I was doing. And of course he had all these horror stories and this and that. And lately I have been, because I have a, a I have a very unusual relationship with most of my physicians. <laughs> and I, I, I came in and I said, dude, you're getting fat. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I've been talking to you about testosterone for 25 <laughs> years. I think you should start. start and, and, doing and actually, it, yeah, and, 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 and he goes, well, why wouldn't, you know, and like, dude, your, your, your clothes are tight. I can see it. <laughs> and yeah, your exactly. And your shoulders are slumpy. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you're not, you cannot maintain, I mean, you can raise testosterone by exercising, but you know, if your testosterone levels are, are down in the dumps, you're going to need to do testosterone, right? You're, you're going to need to do something. And I see it all the time. You, you do see these, these, you know, one of my big pet peeves is these, is these primary care docs and, you know, doctors are overworked and, and you know, everybody's stressed, nobody's sleeping well, but, but, you know, I, to go to my primary care doc and have them look like that, right. They're fat and they're sluggish and, you know, and, and that's the person who's advising you on your health. You have to go a little bit. Mm, I'm not sure, you know, what healthy is. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I love how you say it. you got to uh, figure out what they look like. Cause that, that's kind of always been my thing is like, um, if you're going to advise me on health, you better be looking like I want to look right. You know, and, 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 and if, and if you are like have a specialty about being able to, you know, put together a, a heart valve or something like that, I don't care whether you're 300 pounds. That doesn't matter. Yeah, because, right, right. You know, you that's be, okay, right? That's okay. But if, right. but if you're advising me on health, <laughs> right? You you better be able to walk it. Yeah, Not just talk it. Just walk yeah. it. I just, I I have, I have a cardiologist uh, who's very famous for putting in stents. Fortunately, I didn't need one, but he was. Uh, he, he walked in, and I go like, okay, this guy is not about health. <laughs> Right. He's not put in stents. Yeah, yeah exactly. He's, he's not going to keep my heart healthy. Yeah. We had a great surgeon here in town. Like, you know, just, this is the guy you need surgery. This is the guy you're going to go to basic surgery. But you know, he spent all his time in the hospital. He was overweight. He was, you know, a horrible shape, you know, but it didn't matter. But if I go to my primary care doctor who, you know, and, and most of them are, I hate to say most of them are, you know, who look, who look old and fat and, you know, and depressed, you know, and they're trying to tell me to eat, right. I'm going to be like, what do you eat? Cause I'll just not do what you're doing. And maybe that'll help. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I gave a, actually, I gave a lecture a long time ago at the, uh, uh, Arizona heart Institute, a big place. And they had, they had, they had like a 300 people there for their morning meeting once a month. And, uh, and I was in their lecture and I couldn't believe it. They had like McDonald's McMuffins, but they were custom made and they were like on steroids. They're like about three times larger than <laughs> McDonald's McMuffin. And I'm going like, this is yeah. the heart Institute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was that was that was that was an eye opener. 
Uh, they also had had quotas for various procedures too. Uh, yeah, which was, <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what you want to hear when you when you go to a physician that they met their quota. Uh, wow. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. I probably. Yeah. Which is met. you know again one of the problems now with traditional medicine, right? Traditional medicine has a place. You need an emergent ost ostomy to save your life. You want traditional medicine in the place, but right. in general, for health focused medicine, that's not that is not that's not foundational health. That 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 is illness medicine. There's a place for it. You need somebody to work with you on foundational health. And again, you you can do so much of that yourself, but you can't do it all yourself. And that's where you yeah. need you know a guide working you through it. Yeah. Do you get resistance from people about hormone therapy from both men and women or not? Or a ton. Yeah. I mean, the biggest fear is, you know, from, from women is cancer, right? You know, is that, well, hormones cause cancer, hormones cause cancer. And then men too, testosterone causes ca prostate cancer, right? You get that all the time. And for women, estrogen causes breast cancer. It has been pounded into everybody's head. And, you know, you know, even the American Urologic Society now is saying, you know, not nah, actually, we, we actually, even in men who have had prostate cancer, mm -hmm. they're advising that testosterone therapy appears to reduce the recurrence and the severity of disease. So even the, you know, one of the most stout foundations is, co is coming around and saying, hmm, maybe our evidence wasn't right. I mean, testosterone, if testosterone caused prostate cancer, why is the 20 year old who has sky high levels not getting prostate cancer and the 80 year old who has no testosterone getting prostate cancer? It mm -hmm. just literally doesn't make sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, yeah, I, I actually, whenever I, I get those comments and I, and I get them from actually a lot of times from physicians, I just uh, forward them. Uh, there's a couple of uh, Mayo Clinic consensus papers that 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 address that. And I go like, okay, if the Mayo Clinic is on board, I, I think that it's you know it's it's not some sort of uh, uh, tinfoil hat people out there. I mean, always, I, the, the problem I see is the doc the doctors are so stuck in their paradigms. Mm -hmm. I will. I have articles like for my women with, you know, for the breast cancer stuff. I mean, the women's health initiative was the, you know, the, the bane of women's hormones and, and even the women's health initiative study, you know, and it wasn't estrogen that actually caused the problem. In fact, when they did estradiol alone, they had a reduced incidence of cancer, but that never made the article. The problem was these artificial progesterones called progestins that were carcinogenic. And we know they are. But the study got so misinterpreted and even the authors came back and said, hey, that wasn't really wasn't really right. But that never got play and people still hang their hat on it. So I will actually arm my patients with these articles, you know, to give them to their doctors. And I've had patients come back and say they said they wouldn't read them. You know, I mean, you know, the, the problem is that we are we are so slow to shift our mindsets. I mean, mm -hmm. We're all like that a little bit. Right. We get it. We want we have our beliefs. We want to hold on to our beliefs, um, you know, and. You know, and even in my world, right, kind of in the orthopedic world to say, oh, wow, everything I, I was doing for a whole lot of years might have been the wrong thing, right? You know, sticking steroids in joints constantly, things like that, probably not the greatest thing. There was lots of things, scoping knees. We now know that doing arthroscopy on a knee is going to rapidly progress, our, progress the, the, the arthritis mm -hmm. to point of knee and joint replacement. We know that other countries have stopped doing it, you know, but... but I always say it's like you just spent all this time and energy building an incredible house and somebody walks in and goes, well, that looks crappy and that's horrible. And then you're like, well, I like it, right? It's really hard for us to have spent, any of us to have spent years and years training and learning something and, and then just sort of turn back around and say, hmm, maybe everything I trained and learned it was wrong. But that's what you have to do in medicine. It's what you have to do every in every field, really. But you know, you have to be able to say, the evidence is mounting that what I was doing is wrong. I need to change my paradigm. And, and, you know, and I think doctors are really unwilling to do that. Yeah. I, unfortunately, and, you know, I, I think you probably experienced uh, familiar with this, uh, you know, a lot of physicians now uh, are not in private practice and they're working for private equity groups. Yeah. And, and that has its all right. I mean, and that has that, its own set of problems, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, 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 on, they're actually on a quota, of procedures yeah. and things like that right. and they, they have you, to perform how much money you can spend and how much time you can spend with patients you mm -hmm. can't adequately learn or teach anything to a patient in a 10-minute appointment it is no. absolutely impossible yeah so it is really just try and do whatever you can to get that patient out of the office and to the next patient yeah. you know and honestly it was what you know finally i i just couldn't do that kind of medicine anymore i really felt like oh my gosh this patient comes in with knee arthritis i really want to explain to them what is knee arthritis why is it happening what do we really need to work on and instead it, 
I could in 10 minutes stick steroid into it, right? You know, and, and so it, you, you, start, you, you start functioning because that's the only thing you can do. Um, you know, and then at some point you start going, hmm, maybe this is, this is not really even ethical, you know? Yeah. Um, let's kind of switch gears here a little bit and I'll talk about peptides and what are peptides and why do they need to be uh, medically managed? I mean, I, I can buy a peptide on the internet. <laughs> right. You can buy a research chemical peptide on the inside of the internet. You know, you cannot buy a prescription for human consumption peptide on the internet. So, so keep in mind, everything you're buying on the internet, you have to check a little box. This is, I am using this for research purposes only. Um, you know, so peptides, for those of you who aren't familiar with them, are basically small chains of amino acids. So pro protein is greater than 50 amino acids. A peptide is less than 50 amino acids. And we make tons of peptides. So just like hormones, we make a lot of peptides. Um, insulin is a peptide. So that's a peptide you're all familiar with. It's basically, uh, it, it, you eat glucose, insulin appears, this peptide appears, it gets rid of the glucose, all is fine. But you've got a lot of other peptides that do things. Your gut makes a peptide called BPC, body protective compound. So when you're injured or the gut is, is irritated, BPC will promote healing and recovery. But much like hormones, a lot of our peptides become deplete as we get older. So we make less BPC or we, we, we you know, for instance, the thymic peptides, are we, when we're babies, we have these giant glands in our chest called thymus glands. Thymus gland is really key to immunity and healing. So that's why little kids heal really fast. They have these giant thymus glands. They respond appropriately to infections. But at about puberty, that gland starts getting smaller. And by, by the time you're, it's, you our age, it's tiny, tiny. So it's not producing the peptides that actually were able to keep you healthy. Something called thymus and alpha one, which is a peptide that's really important for immunity or thymus and beta four, which is a peptide that's really important for recovery from injury. So you don't end up with just a bunch of scar tissue. You actually can recover. So you can actually give back those peptides that you made when you were little. I mean, the really big kind of Crazy anti-aging people are trying to get thymus glands from baby and transplant thymus glands because it's that important of an organ. But we can give back at least what it does, give back the thymic peptides. So think about peptides as, you know, the, kind of the icing on the cake. You, 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 we lose hormones. We need to replace hormones. We also lose peptides. So you can use them for all sorts of healing purposes and for longevity purposes. So there's both endogenous peptides that we make. And then there's, you know, ones that we can sort of, that we've manufactured, that we've sort of, you know, been able to fit, figure out, do certain things. A lot of the peptides we use are peptides that are naturally made by the body that we're, that we're adding in. Mm -hmm. Like I said, body protective compound 157, thymus and beta four, thymus and alpha one, um, something called KPV made by the gut. And then we use a lot of what we call mitochondrial peptides as well. So mitochondria are their own little organisms. So weirdly inside our cells, these ancient bacteria have taken root and that's what enabled us to move from being sea dwelling to air breathing people. And those little mitochondria have their own DNA. They're their own, they were their own bacteria, they have their own DNA. So they also make their own peptides. The problem is that think about your mitochondria, it's essential to you having energy to do anything. Mm -hmm. So if mitochondria are damaged, they make less of their mitochondrial peptides. Those mitochondrial peptides have become key to our cell health as well. So now we can give back some of the mitochondrial peptides even. So we can actually start recording, restoring mitochondrial health. And mitochondria may be the key to a whole lot of different diseases, cancers, inflammatory bowel diseases, brain diseases. Probably all of those are diseases where we lose we lose the ability to make proper energy to function. So that's been a big area of focus. And there's, um, there's a big research lab out of USC, COBAR, that's, doing, that's working with nothing but mitochondrial peptides and developing these mitochondrial peptides. So peptides are really incredibly valuable mm -hmm. because they, they have very specific functions. So hormones have a lot of functions, but peptides have very specific functions. So you can actually isolate them down a little bit more. They're super safe. So especially these ones that we make on our own, you like, BPC, you could, if you, if you could afford it, you could take massive amounts of it, it would do nothing bad to you. Um, so they're super safe and they're, they're uh, incredibly powerful tools to sort of change diseases without throwing a lot of drugs that have a lot of side effects into the mix. Their downsides are their availability. So yes, you can buy them on just online. Um, and, you know, and again, 
no, there's nobody who can just sell them online who is a who is a uh, you know, who actually makes these for human consumption. You have to mark that they're being used for research purposes. Mm-hmm. You know, and you can do that. I mean, that's you know, that's up to you. You know, what you don't know when you're using something that's designed for research purposes is exactly what you're getting. So we as physicians only use compounding pharmacies where we know they've been tested and everything, you know, and, and, you know, and everything is sort of uh, following all these guidelines and regulations. And, and so we get our peptides from a compounding pharmacist, different compounding pharmacies make different peptides. We've, we have to work with ones all over the U S quite frankly, to get some of the different peptides we use for different purposes. And, and we prescribe them to patients. So they're actually just like a prescription drug. Um, and, and we use them both, for longevity, a lot for disease. So if you came to me and you like your gut after healing, healing from this ostomy, you know, oral BPC, huge. In fact, in mice, when they stuck a big old hole in the gut, it completely repaired when they gave them the oral BPC. So that's, you know, so, so if somebody came to me after your surgery, I would have said, let's get you on some good oral BPC. Let's get this gut healed faster. You did fine, but, um, but some, not everybody does. But you can also use them again, let's say, hormones are all stable. What else do I need to do? Because if I'm losing hormones, I need to replace those. If I'm losing peptides. I need to replace those. So in our longevity protocols, we also cycle in peptides. So we have people, you know, stabilized on their hormones, but we're going to make sure that we give back at least kind of through the year, different peptides, some that restore the pineal gland, some that help the thymus, you know, or make what the thymus was doing. Um, you know, some, you know, some that help the mitochondria to regenerate. So we can cycle those into our course. And so what we'll, what we'll do is we, you know, we kind of see our patients on every three to four month basis. We're like, okay, now we need to hit you with, you know, a six week course of this, because that's going to be kind of in our longevity protocol. So a lot of things are done kind of these quarterly basis um, in terms of that. And, you know, and is that, are, are those going to be essential tools for us to be healthy to 120? Don't know but they probably are going to make a difference. And they they definitely make a difference in how you feel. Yeah. Do you need accountability? Are you looking to change the course of your life, but have failed to keep on track? Too often we take in information and fail to act. Do you need an accountability program to stay the course? Then go to www.thestandard.academy and find out about my accountability program that goes with my course that helps you find out what you want, why you want it, and how to get it. The accountability program keeps you on track to get results. Are there any supplements that are useful in terms of improving mitochondrial health? Yeah, definitely. Um, So, you know, quite the biggest problem with getting, uh, with, with supplements is getting them to the mitochondria. So because the mitochondria, again, are their own beings, you know, I, I, that always freaks me out, right? That we have these little bacteria really living in our cells, but that's what they were, ancient bacteria. And so they have their own cell membrane. So whereas we can take a supplement like coenzyme Q10, coenzyme Q10, great energy producing, helps with ATP production, but it actually can't get to the mitochondria. So, but there is something called urolithin A. Urolithin A actually comes from pomegranates. Um, and urolithin A actually does get into the mitochondria and actually improve oxidative phosphorylation or producing your energy currency, your money, which is mm-hmm. ATP. So urolithin A is a supplement that's super helpful. I use that one a lot when like people recover from COVID, things like that to try and help with mitochondrial function. Spermidine is another one. So spermidine, horrible name, but spermidine came from, you know, it's, it's found in super high quality quantities in, in a few things, sperm being one of them, breast milk being another one, things that are essential for life. You see high levels of spermidine in the higher levels of our spermidine, the longer we live. And we, we know largely because spermidine has a very nice effect on mitochondrial function. Um, it's also really good, what we call autophagy inducing agent, meaning if you think about one of the things we do in longevity also is we want to sort of always be taking out the bad stuff, taking out the trash. Okay. That's called a, autophagy. You hear a lot mentioned about NAD. What's mm-hmm. your thoughts on that? So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the naysayer on NAD, which a lot of your people aren't going to like. Um, and I will, I will tell you, yes, NAD is critical. You have to have NAD. You have to have the exact perfect ratio of NAD to NADH. 
Um, so it's really ratios that are really important there, but you want a high NAD, NADH ratio. Altered ratios can lead to cancers, things like that. So all these people who are doing NAD infusions, right now, there is not one, not one scientific paper that shows that you can give NAD as an IV infusion or a patch or a nasal spray and get it inside the cell where NAD works. It can get into your bloodstream, but it can't get into the cell. It's too big of a molecule. Okay. So it's it, honestly, do people feel better when they get NAD infusions? Large, lots of times it's because they've also done a lot of other vitamins with the NAD infusion. But in general, it's a very expensive. People are spending a lot of money for NAD infusions for something that has, again, not one. <laughs> if, somebody, if somebody writes me a study finally that shows that this gets into the cell, I'm going to be okay. So do the precursors work like NR and NMN? They make more sense because they actually can get intracellularly. But one of the problems is that... Um, that we also need to work on why the NAD is being lower, which is because we upregulate an enzyme that degrades NAD. So hand in hand, if you're gonna do anything that ups NAD, you, have to, you also have to block the enzyme that's degrading NAD or you're not gonna get anywhere. So you have to block mm -hmm. something called CD38. And there's some supplements that do that. Um, so it's, it's a pretty tricky process. And it's also probably a pretty tricky process to know exactly where your ratios need to be because you, it's difficult to measure to say, are we actually helping health, not promoting cancer cells, things like that. So I'm, I'm a fan of the precursors, but I cycle them. I don't stay on them continuously because of that whole cancer issue. And I am, and my belief until somebody proves otherwise. And again, it's because I base everything off scientific data that I do. And, you know, and again, I'm not saying NAD is bad. NAD is critical. It's critical. I don't think we have adequate research yet to support that all these people who are charging a whole lot of money and doing NAD infusions are doing anything. Oh, okay. And the, the first thing you mentioned, Euro, uh, Euro, a a? Euro, Euro yeah. yeah. Is, is that something that's available? Is that a prescription item or is that a, a no, that's a supplement. Um, I think a company called um, Mitopure makes that, um, I think they're the only company that makes it, uh, so, um, yeah, urolithin, U-R-O-L-I-T-H-I-N. Urolithin A is a really pretty remarkable, and then any of you guys who have had like, uh, you know, post-viral fatigue um, or, you know, ran a marathon, you can't recover from things like this. It's a really nice supplement to help. Um, they make actually a great little pack that has a, it's like a protein with the urolithin A, really nice for cell function. But right now it's one of the few supplements we know actually gets in, intramitochond into the mitochondrial membrane. And, and benefits um, and benefits ATP production. So I, I really like that supplement and you know, it's, it's not cheap, but it's, it's cheaper than some of the mitochondrial peptides. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's talk about uh, a little bit about, and we kind of touched about it, but what is regenerative orthopedics? And okay. let me ask you, how much do you, do you still do surgery? So I don't do, I, I don't do surgery anymore aside from some kind of more um, minor things within the regenerative realm. So I'll, I'll be, I'll place things inside discs, things like that. So under, you know, sort of in a OR under a live x-ray, you know, with the patient sedated, but everything can be done through a very small, you know, sort of port. Um, so we'll, you know, we do things where we're sort of trying to rebuild discs and in, in degenerative spines and things like that. So kind of from a mi more minor surgical procedures but I don't do, you know, knee scopes, anything like that. Now, the, the key to regenerative orthopedics is that, that there are regenerative orthopedic people everywhere anymore doing stem cells. I know you just had a, you know, a big talk on stem cells and um, doing stem cells and, you know, doing platelet injections for joints. And, and, you know, and I, and I, and so that's kind of in that regenerative orthopedic realm, but what I would caution in the regenerative orthopedic space is what we've learned over the past two years is that one of the reasons that your joints have worn out is not just, you know, I was a, I was a big time skier and, and I tore my ACLs four times. I have horrible knee arthritis, but my knees don't hurt at all. If you look at my x-rays, somebody would say, oh, you need your knees replaced. I don't, I can do everything. The key is why does, you know, I used to work with a lot of football players, still have a few numbers in, the, in our practice, but you know, why can one football player be beat up to all hell and be fine and another one get beat up and, you know, just a little bit and their knee is horrible. The underlying truth is that this is an inflammatory disease. 
and that your genetics play a role. So you get this injury. And the, if you have an injury, the key is your body goes into this state to heal the injury, but that inflammatory state needs to settle back down and then you need to heal the injury, right? So you get inflamed and you get these what we call pro-inflammatory proteins that come into play. They should go away. The anti-inflammatory pro proteins come into play. And what we've now found is that people who have bad degenerative arthritis, and you'll see people have it in like, you know, it's not just your knees, it's your back and both knees and now your hip goes. Most people have it in multiple joints. That's because it is a disease. And we've linked it to some high levels of some inflammatory proteins, like something called interleukin-1 beta, and then high levels of some really bad enzymes, something called metallomatrix protease 3, that degrade cartilage. And so if, if those get upregulated and then you can't downregulate them, what happens is you start this cascade of destruction. So if I expect I'm going to just take stem cells um, and put them into your knee, into your body that already has this unfortunate genetic base, am I going to cure you? Probably not. You will probably temporarily feel better, but it's probably not going to, in the long run, make a long-term change. So what we really focus on first, because I'm a fan of things like stem cells, but first, I have to get the body prepped for that. I have to do things that lower interleukin-1 beta, that lower this MMP3. I have to actually use, use things that make me not set you into an inflammatory state when I put these stem cells into you mm -hmm. so that I can actually get the advantage of now when I put stem cells into your knee or um, you know, things into your, into your spine to rebuild, to rebuild discs, that you actually make forward progress that's sustained and, and not just set off. And I think that's where this disconnect has happened between the joints and the body. Orthopedics, we sort of think about, and even the regenerative orthopedic people who are doing a lot of stem cells and platelet cells and things like that. The problem is they're not thinking about why that happened in the first place. And there was a great article that came out in British Medical Journal last year about is 2021, the year we start rethinking arthritis as a disease, you know, because it's a disease, it's not wear and tear. No more mm -hmm. than wearing out your brain is because you used it too much, you know? so. That's what we're trying to really re-educate people on. And there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's a drug coming to market in the next year called Xylosil, maybe the next year, maybe next two years, it's being fast-tracked, um, called Xylosil, that actually is a really good agent, so subcutaneous injection you give yourself that blocks that interleukin-1 beta and blocks MMP3. We've been using it for about three years, um, and it's a remarkable tool in that, and, and in fact, in, in many people, they don't even need the procedure because they feel so much better just on, on the, on the um, xylosol of pentacin. So, so we have a lot of little tools that we use like that. One of our goals is whenever something's approved in another country and used widely, we start looking at it because it takes so long for the U.S. to get a lot of these things, right? Mm -hmm. like, like peptides, um, you know, for, for, for those to start to go through the whole process to actually get final approval can take typically about 15 to 17 years. So if you sit there and wait for that to happen, you've lost a lot of lives and a lot of quality of life. And so we do, we sort of pride ourselves on being that bridge between research and clinical. When something's safe, effective, being used in other places for a while, let's get it. And so we find ways to get those things to us and utilize them. So we've been using this drug that's now gonna be fast-tracked through, um, we've been using it for about three years and it might be available to everybody in the next couple of years. But, you know, so those are kind of things you get, you, you need to, you, you've got to always be reading, you've always got to be learning and, and always be willing to change your mind about what you're doing. Yeah. Um, the, um, so when do you decide as a practitioner, what's your criteria to, when do you decide stem cells, peptides, PRP, all the other regenerative stuff that's out there. When, how, how, what's your decision process of, of what to use where? So you, again, the peptides kind of fall into that category of let's get the body optimized and prime. So I will almost always start with the least invasive things first. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be th using things like, um, like this pentacin polysulfate, also known as xylosol, like using peptide therapies making sure the hormones are all optimized because about half your patients, if not more, by the time you get them to that state, they're like, mm, I'm pretty good. I don't need to spend $5,000 on my stem cells or whatever it might be. Right. So I, I almost always start with 
optimization of the human being first, and then moving into the regenerative realm of, okay, now I'm going to put, you know, and we use a whole conglomerate of different things. We actually, you know, are even mixing sometimes peptides in with the into intraarticular injections or spine injections, things like that. So, you know, so lots and lots of different tools that you can use, but I, my belief is that those are a waste of money until you get the body into a more optimal state. So you usually start with the optimization. Now, that may be untrue when I have a young person, for instance, who comes in, who has a torn meniscus in their knee, right? Mm -hmm. I might at that stage go right into doing a platelet fibrin matrix, you know, with, with like stem cell um, to that person because they're, they've had an acute injury. Let's actually help them heal that faster. So a lot, you know, so, so that may change that, that a little bit, or if I have some, you know, even even somebody our age who comes in with a, you know, a really an acute meniscal, you know, even degenerative, degenerative meniscal tear, I may hit that earlier with a regenerative procedure if it's a more acute injury versus something chronic. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. If you, you know, it's kind of, I'm, I'm interested in reading a book by uh, Sean Wells. I don't know if you know who he is. Mm -hmm. he, okay. I'm reading his book and it's, it's a challenge for me and I'm, I'm reading it to con, to actually take in the information, not just kind of get get through it. I actually just read like about ten pages a time because right. it's, it's just so packed. Complicated. So, yeah. so, but there's so many things that you know. He said, "Oh, you, you can take this. You can take this. You can take this. You can take this. You can take this." And I'm just like, say, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you, in terms of over the counter, what would be the three to five supplements that you think people should be taking. Yeah, you're right. I, it's, it's, it is a little overwhelming because you read these things like, well, I need that. Well, I need that. In fact, you know, it was funny. We, we have this, um, for your listeners, we have something called the Human Optimization Academy. It's really where we actually try and teach people more like, you know, from the scientific data. So we were, you know, giving you guys the scientific data. So we're actually trying to teach more like we learned as physicians, you know, those, the, you know, so it's more of a scientific learning center for the person, people, so they understand their bodies and understand the research and things like that. So it's called Human Optimization Academy. If those guys want to join, just look at bli.academy because it's, it's pretty fun. And we have these Q&A se sessions. Uh, I think we had one this afternoon, actually. And, and, and you know, there's live Q&As with everybody who's part of the academy. And, and I get questions all the time about a new supplement. And, you know, and it's always hard because, you know, I can answer the questions about these new supplements going, yeah, it is a remarkable supplement. <laughs> you know, it is. Um, it does all these amazing things. But how much am I going to actually take? Uh, number one, you're, financially, it becomes a struggle. Number two, it's just a heck of a lot of pills to swallow. And number three, yeah, at some point you start to have a counterproductive because your poor liver can't handle these many things being put into it. So mm -hmm. you, so how do you discern what to take? And I think if you look at sort of the basics that everybody needs, um, you know, number one, everybody needs vitamin D, you know, so, so a vitamin D3, ideally with a K2 mixed with it because K2 helps get vitamin D3 into the cells. Most people need 10,000 IUs a day, unless you're somebody who's in the sun constantly. And even then a lot of people don't get enough. So and you're never going to be overdosing on vitamin D at that dose. People, you know, you get all the time about, you know, overdosing on vitamin D. It's actually not that easy to overdose on vitamin D. And all that will happen is you'll start to get a little nauseous and you stop the vitamin D and it gets better. So all your docs will say, oh, 10,000 vitamin D is too much is, you know, no, it's not going to be too much for anybody. So 10,000 I use a vitamin D3 um, with K2. I think everybody needs omega-3s unless you're somebody who eats just nothing but omega threes in their diet. Most of us do have omega sixes in our diet. If you're a meat eater or anything like that, you're going to have a lot of omega sixes, linoleic acids, arachidonic acids you need to balance those with omega threes. So I think everybody needs a really good omega three supplement. Um, omega threes are really interesting because, you know, one of the pathways that we, for inflammation all comes from omega threes, Mm -hmm. converting into something called specialized pro-resolving mediators or SPMs, which are kind of new to our radar. But when you talk about healing from an injury or your surgery or things like that, SPMs are critical. They are what set off the turning things from pro-inflammatory to anti-inflammatory. So if you don't have enough omega-3s, you can't make these specialized pro-resolving mediators, these SPMs. So you, everybody needs omega-3s, super neuroprotective. You've got to balance this omega-6, omega-3 ratios. So I think that's a key to everybody. I think, I think everybody should just take a basic, good multivitamin supplement, right? 
you know, I think if most multivitamins are going to be an, it needs to be a, a very good quality one. And there's a lot of good companies out there, but, you know, I think that, that if you want to sort of say, you know, I just need some good basics that, that most of us need at least some, most multivitamins don't have a whole lot of everything in it, but it's going to be kind of adjunctively helpful. Yeah. Can you mention a couple of manufacturers that make good, good, good multivitamin? I mean, we, um, so, so we use one that's only sold to physicians called Zymogen. They have a, a thing called vital cell. That's sort of really good. I think athletic greens, AG one. Um, I, I think their powdered supplement is actually really good. I, I like orthomolecular as a company, uh, that's, you know, that you can go direct to consumer on. Um, if you go to ohphealth.com, you can actually get, uh, there's some OHP health has it's, it's, so we've sort of refined that it's a supplement company that I work with that actually we've sort of tested these all. So we only, we don't, we've only, only put on there things that we really have vetted, um, on there. So if you go there, there's a couple of multi, if you just kind of do multivitamin, there's a couple on there that we sort of vetted a couple of them that are, you know, are the only sell to, to a physician service. So, so I think that's a good place to go and look, um, you know, and I think that probably there's a whole bunch of people out there I haven't mentioned, but those are sort of my go-tos. And then mm -hmm. I, I honestly think a lot of people, you know, need magnesium <laughs> and most mm -hmm. of us are depleting magnesium. So taking a little magnesium before you go to bed at night, because magnesium is not in our soil very much anymore. And we usually get it from vegetables that were grown in the soil, but it's been over, not in the soil anymore. So I think taking a magnesium something before you go to bed is also a really good thing. So if I had to refine my supplement base down to that, and then I think cycling things like spermidine, for instance, we know mm -hmm. across the board, if you have higher levels of spermidine, you live longer, you stay smarter. So, so you can take a small dose all the time, but then cycling a larger dose periodically. So there's a lot of things. And we talk about like the, the supplements like NMN and NR cycle, those go 12 weeks on 12 weeks off, 12 weeks on. Right. So when you think about some of these things that way, number one, it becomes financially easier to cycle vitamins, you, you won't overwhelm pathways. Our bodies were never designed to kind of have the same thing all the time, right? So you don't overwhelm pathways. So when you get back past those basic nutrient needs, start thinking about cycling things, 12 week cycles, you know, turn things on with your, with your, you know, your NMN and, or NR, those things that produce NAD, do that for 12 weeks. Now stop it do something else, go back, go on spermidine. Spermidine has the other phase. It actually is an autophagy induced and it actually gets rid of cells, gets rid of bad stuff. So that's, those are kind of the, the keys of, you know, of longevity. I think it overlooked. I think very few supplements should be taken continuously aside from the basics. Mm -hmm. Antioxidants, antioxidants, small amounts, great. Large amounts, not good. So if you're continually taking all these tons of antioxidants, your body needs oxidative stress. When we mm -hmm. talked about those mitochondrial peptides, one of the reasons your mitochondria produce those peptides is when they're a little stressed. Exercise, they produce right. these peptides because they're stressed. If there's zero oxidative stress, you actually are doing yourself harm. You need low levels of oxidative stress. It's a little bit like if you go exercise, go work out, and then you come home and you take your massive amounts of vitamin C and, and you know, and resveratrol and all those antioxidants, you just undid your muscle building because you need oxidative stress to build muscles. So you've got to look at antioxidants with a really cautious eye. Small amounts used periodically are good. Large amounts used continuously, not good. Even though they get tons and tons and tons of press, take your antioxidants. Yeah, you need some, you don't need as much as people are taking. No. Well, that's good. Yeah. You know, I always, I, you know, I, I appreciate you, you bring that down to, to a manageable number. Uh, because I always, I always love those articles, you know, especially like, like 20 things to do to improve your whatever. And like, by the time you get to number eight, you don't remember what number one, two or three were. <laughs> no, I, I will have patients come in, you know, who've seen a functional doctor or a chiropractor literally with these three pages of supplements. I'm like, I have no idea. Number one, how you afford this. Number two, how you can, even, you know, open these bottles. I, I, you know, it would overwhelm me and exhaust me to do that. Yeah. You know, and it is where peptides kind of come in and play a bit of a role too, is because you can cover a lot of bases by getting the body in a more homeostatic state by using mm -hmm. things like hormones and peptides. So you might not need a billion other things in. Yeah. Yeah. So I get it. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, as always, uh, we had, we actually, we had another uh, 
interview prior to this and, and folks if you like this you should go listen to the other one uh and uh because we talked uh, we talked a lot actually we talked a lot more about uh peptides in, in that one that was actually focused yeah. on, we'll focus on that so uh if you want to know about more about peptides now if people are interested in working with you where can they find you so just go to boulderlongevity.com so boulder we're in Boulder, Colorado, longevity.com, but we um, licensed in almost every state now. So we have patients all over the world, actually. So we're happy to see almost anybody. There's a, a few states that are still holdouts, but most of them we have. So we're happy to see anybody from any state. We work virtually. Obviously, if you need a procedure, you have to fly here. But, um, but for most states, we can work with you virtually. And we can do a whole test of labs. And then, you know, the other thing, if you guys just want to kind of expand your learning and learn a little bit more, you know, like, from a scientific side, not just the Instagram influencer side, then join our academy, BLI.academy. Um, and that will actually, we have these, you know, we great lectures on there. We have these Q and A's, we go through all the recent scientific data. So those are really fun too. So those are two places can, that you can kind of go to work. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. And explain a, a little bit about what somebody says, okay, I wanna work with you. What, what's the what's the first what's the process what what happens there so the first step is we really just talk for a little bit so there's this initial console where we kind of talk and we get what your goals are why are you here uh you know what you know what do you have specific problems or you just want to be healthy and then we order a host of 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 kind of extensive labs a lot of times just to sort of look at overall health there's a lot to be gleaned from some very basic labs we don't i don't go overboard with you know doing every single you know, gut microbiome and, and food allergen testing, unless we need them sometimes, but rarely. But we do look at a really, you know, cardiometabolic, we make sure that your insulin levels are perfect. We make sure that all those markers from metabolic health, because that's one of the first pieces is perfect. We look at cholesterol in a very different way. We're looking at more from an inflammatory perspective. High cholesterol means nothing. It's, it's, inflammatory pieces that we need to look at. So we look at a cardiometabolic panel in a very different way. We look at all of your hormones, um, how they're working together. We look at a, you know, sort of very extensive thyroid panel and we, um, and then we usually run what's called a micronutrient intracellular micronutrient panel. So you talk about what supplements do you need? This is our way of saying, well, we can look inside your cells and say that okay, you are deficient here. You actually need the supplement as opposed to me just saying, oh, everybody needs this, right? So we can actually look it's a very interesting test that looks inside the T lymphocytes to see what kind of nutrients are being stored inside the T lymphocytes. So that's a really cool test. So we usually then sit and we sit down and that's a eat your Wheaties hour and a half appointment where we just kind of go through this stuff. And we talk in detail about where do you've kind of fallen deficiencies and where do we really need to focus on? You know, and then we sort of start staging our focusing on things saying, okay, let's focus on this right now. This is our biggest piece. We've got to get your metabolic health in order. Um, maybe that's with peptides. Maybe it's with hormones. Maybe it's with supplements. And then, and then we move to to next step until we kind of get you into a point where you're, you know, you're everything baselines there. And then we're meeting every three to four months and we're saying, okay, let's refine this. Let's do now let's switch this supplement to this and walking you through this whole process of longevity. Okay, great, great. And uh, we'll have links to the, uh, to your website and to some of the other things that we talked about in the, uh, uh, in the program notes. So we can, uh, so if you need to, those resources, so thanks again for coming on the program. And, of course, thank uh, you for inviting me. I always love it. And, and uh, we'll, we'll have to do it again. I, I look forward to seeing you in person at the World Peptide Conference. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, coming up uh, in, come, in October, October, I think, isn't it? October, yeah. I think it's October or September. I think it's October. Yeah, October. Uh, Vegas. So, 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 yeah, it is. It is in Vegas, uh, which is, a, uh, I love living in Vegas. I, <laughs> I a love lot of it. conferences. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of conferences, but but it's it's actually uh, uh, and you know when you live in Vegas, you don't go down to the strip. No. rarely. You, right. you, you know, it's it's just a, you, you, it's kind of like, but there's all sorts of advantages to being here uh, because of the strip. So uh, it's 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 a lot of fun. So once again, thank you. This right. is Orsi official old guy at oldguytalksme.com, and I want you to do several things. I want you to subscribe, share, rate, and review. And you, if you have not already done so. Well, I want you to get a copy of my free digital magazine at the standard.academy forward slash magazine, where I, well, I talk with experts about all sorts of stuff, uh, including some anti-aging stuff, 
and uh, I have some articles in there and also, well, things that you can do to enhance your relationship. I think you know what I mean by when I say that. <laughs> Until next time. Remember, it's all about creating a kick-ass life for yourself and those that you love. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining Dr. Orist and his incredible guest. Like what you heard and learned? Then be sure to do three things. One, subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Two, share this with someone who may need to hear it. Three, leave a review and rate this podcast. Opt in at www.thestandard.academy forward slash magazine and get our free digital magazine with savings, articles, and deeper dives into cool controversy. Be the guy who takes action. Without action, you're not going to get the results you want. Thank you again and make it a great day.